You're watching LMCC, your community TV. Welcome to Talking Points. I'm Kay Erickson with the League of Women Voters of South Tonka, and today we're talking about strengthening Minnesota's democracy. Now you might wonder why we're talking about strengthening democracy in a state that almost always leads the nation in voter turnout. However, even in the last election, just over 64% of eligible Minnesota voters actually voted. So even in our state, there's room for improvement. My two guests today are going to talk about election-related legislation that's being debated right now during this session. My first guest is Secretary of State Steve Simon. Now, while the Secretary of State's office has a number of responsibilities, perhaps one of the most important duties of that office is to oversee Minnesota's elections. Secretary of State Simon has a number of proposals that he's proposing before the legislature this year, and he's going to talk about those. My second guest at the second segment of the program is Nick Harper, who's Civic Engagement Director with the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. He's going to talk about the issues the League is following this session. Thank you for being here today, Secretary Simon. I know you have a number of proposals on your legislative agenda. What's your number one priority? I would say this. I think it's really about investing in democracy. That's the main theme. Very important in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I like to say that I'm in the democracy business, <laughs> and business is booming in Minnesota. We are, once again, for the second election in a row, number one in the country for voter turnout and participation. But that means we have something worth preserving. And I have a number of legislative proposals that fall into that theme of investing in democracy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's money, sometimes that's policy, but we got to do it if we're going to stay number one, and more important than the ranking, if we're going to keep the quality of the democracy that we have in Minnesota. What do you want to start with then? Uh, I know you've talked about restoration of voting rights. You've yep. talked about automatic voter registration. Sure. Let's uh, talk about the individual pieces. Absolutely. We can do that in that order. So okay. restoration of voting rights. Very important. I think it's a fairness issue. I think it's a justice issue in Minnesota. And it's got increasing, growing momentum and bipartisan mm. support, not just in Minnesota, but across the country. And here's the issue. We have 50 or 55,000 people in Minnesota who fall into the category of having left prison behind. They once had a felony conviction. That's passed. Uh, they have done their time. And yet they can't vote. Um, and in Minnesota, that's particularly an issue because people tend to have um, many years in which they are out of prison, but maybe they're on supervised release or probation, and they can't vote. And that has um, a number of um, different downstream effects. First of all, we may uh, unknowingly be disenfranchising a second generation. Mm. Every study out there shows, every study, that children who grew up in homes where there are voters are far more likely to vote. Mm -hmm. And if you have someone, mom or dad or someone else in the household, who's out, who's done everything we've asked of them, they've done their time, that's all behind them, and they still can't vote, then that means that next generation might be lost as well. But it's also in everyone's interest, mine, yours, and all of your viewers, that we have people who have left prison feel reinvested and reconnected to the community. Why? Because if they don't feel that, they're likely to reoffend and end up back where they were. So if we want to tell someone who's come out of prison, <laughs> who's done their time, you're back on the team as long as you behave yourself, as long as you are employed, as long as you're paying taxes, we should also tell them that, yeah, you're on the team for other purposes as well. You get to choose who governs you and how. Again, growing momentum, very bipartisan, Republicans and Democrats on board in states like Iowa, in states like mm. North Dakota, in states like Florida, really a growing movement. So what are the arguments against doing that? Uh, well, those folks are better spokespeople for themselves than I am for them. But if they were here, they'd say something like, well, it's sort of about punishment, mm -hmm. okay. and we want to continue to punish someone even when they're out of prison because they have done wrong. I guess the point that I, and more importantly, many other people have brought up is if a judge or if the legislature decide that someone should only have a determined length of a prison sentence and that they're then allowed to leave, someone has made the determination that they're safe enough to be among us. They should be getting a job and housing and putting their lives and families back together. It makes sense to me that they also get the right to decide who governs them as well. Now, am I understanding it correctly that in Minnesota we have fairly low incarceration rates but sometimes really long probation and parole rates, exactly, and right. that sometimes people are on probation and parole without having even gone to jail. Correct. So this will affect 
you know, so not let, being able to vote affects people who haven't really even been in prison. You're absolutely right. And Minnesota is one of those states. This goes back decades. Doesn't matter which political party is in control. We have weighted our sentences toward the non-prison part. There was a story reported on in the Star Tribune a couple weeks ago of a young woman in her early 30s who, get this, she's out of prison. Mm -hmm. She had a non-violent drug offense. 40 years of supervised release or probation. 40. She will not be eligible to vote until her mm -hmm. 70s. She's in her early 30s. That's true. You can look it up. You can Google it. That's not fair. We don't want that. Why should we shut someone out of our system for 40 years for a nonviolent drug offense? She did wrong. She did her time. She's out. And you're telling me for four decades we're not going to let her choose who governs her or her children or her family? That's not right. No. Okay. Um, automatic voter registration yes. now. Minnesota, I thought we ought to ha already have a, a kind of a form of automatic voter registration. Can you explain your proposal right. and what we do now? Well, so automatic voter registration is a really exciting reform. There are a dozen or more states that have adopted it. There are red states, there are blue states. There's no okay. political hue to this whatsoever. Um, and you're right, in a sense, there's less here than meets the eye. You hear something like automatic voter registration. <laughs> it sounds like a very sweeping reform, but really it's only um, a modification of what we already do. Yeah. And what your viewers may know that we already have in Minnesota is when you get to get or renew a driver's mm -hmm. license, you take the eye chart test, you do the other things, <laughs> and there's a box, if you've ever noticed, on mm -hmm. the form that says, hey, uh, check this box if you also want this information to double as your voter registration information to register you to vote. And you can check a box, a so-called opt-in. Mm -hmm. All that this legislation would do is take the same system we have now and make that same box on the same form and opt out. So oh. now, instead of checking if you do want to be registered to vote, you would only check it if you're saying, thanks, but no thanks, I don't want to be registered to vote. That's it. All the other steps, A through Z, or I should say mm. B through <laughs> Z, we're only changing step A, mm. but B through Z, all the same filters, screening, mm. security checks, everything is exactly the same. So mm. in a sense, despite the sweeping title, there's mm. less hair than okay. meets the eye. And in other states where they've done this, it can really move the needle. More yeah. people are registered, more people vote, more people are in the system. And, you know, I'm a huge defender of our same-day registration system in Minnesota, but if the goal here is to have more people in the system earlier than game day, earlier than election day, this is the way to do it. So we can get going on the security procedures, not just on game day, on election day, but weeks, months earlier. And that's what I think we should want. So it really should help our election officials keep on top of the whole system and the process for making sure people are um, eligible to vote. Right. Um, when we're talking about voting, can you talk a little bit about our current system in, of ensuring that people are eligible? I think, you know, we have same-day registration. I know there are databases. Can you talk a, a little bit about how we sure. make sure that somebody who registers to vote is actually eligible to yes. vote? Yes, great point. And Minnesota has a very clean, very honest system with a lot of integrity in it. It stood the test of time. We've had knockdown, drag out <laughs> contests, as you know, Coleman, Franken, and everyone was turning over every stone to find, you know, potential fraud, and they really didn't find any. That's because it's an honest system. So to your point, we have a lot of steps before, during, and after the registration and voting process to ensure the integrity of the system. So the basic rule in Minnesota is if you want to register to vote, you have to demonstrate two things. You are who you say you are, mm -hmm. and you live where you say you live, both. Now, Minnesota law is generous in terms of the ways you can do that. Obviously, most people use a driver's license, but there are other ways to do it. You can use a utility bill. You can use other prescribed documents. You can even have a neighbor, someone who lives in your precinct, uh, vouch for you uh, and swear under penalty of perjury that you are who you say you are or live where you say you live. Mm -hmm. So then after that, our office um, uh, subscribes to and checks every single voter mm -hmm. registration against multiple databases mm -hmm. to check for things like citizenship, felony status, age, residency. We even subscribe to and check every voter registration against two different death databases. If you can believe <laughs> that, that's morbid. But there's the Federal Social Security Death Index mm -hmm. and there's the Minnesota Department of Health Death Index, just so we're making sure we're uh, catching uh, uh, voters who, who might have uh, passed away. So um, I'm very confident that the system is clean. And one of the reasons we know that is uh, under state law, our county attorneys, our prosecutors, have to report mm -hmm. to us periodically what they find. Every time they find even investigation of uh, uh, an allegation of uh, someone voting or registering who shouldn't, they have to report that to us in terms of 
the investigation, charges, convictions. And the last annual report that we saw uh, showed 11 uh, convictions mm -hmm. for any sort of uh, misbehavior at the polls, registration, or voting. That's out of millions of voters. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny, tiny isolated problem. There are always a handful, a couple of handfuls, but that's it. Yes, that, that, uh, that's um, reassuring, really, that we have a really secure system. Um, on to another topic. I know that election cybersecurity has been in the news nationwide and in Minnesota. Can you talk a little bit about what you would do there? Huge, huge issue. And the reason it matters to your viewers and to everyone in Minnesota is Minnesota was one of the 21 states that was targeted by a foreign government in 2016. Okay. The good news is that we were able to keep the bad guys out and nothing bad happened. The bad news is all the federal intelligence officials tell us, as recently as a few weeks ago when I was mm. in Washington, D.C., mm. expect more of this and expect it from more sources, not just the one government, but other outsiders trying to undermine our democracy. So that means we've got to spend time, attention, and money. Fortunately, Congress and the President came through. I want to give them credit where it's due. And about a year ago, they passed a law that gave millions of dollars to the states for election security money. Our share of that in Minnesota was $6.6 .6 million. But there's a catch. <laughs> the catch is that Minnesota is one of the few states that adds an extra step. In Minnesota, even though this is federal money coming from Washington, the state legislature has to sign off on our use of that money. Okay. So there is literally right now $6.6 .6 million sitting in an account in St. Paul for our use for election security. And we can't touch mm. it, not one penny of it, unless the state legislature blesses that. And so far, there's been some stonewalling going on. It had passed the House, the state House, in broad bipartisan fashion, overwhelming vote, both Republicans and Democrats. The Senate, though, has been a stumbling block. And a majority in the Senate, the majority uh, uh, leadership has blocked it so far for reasons that are not clear. They haven't articulated mm -hmm. any problem with it. They haven't objected in any way to the plan that we set forth, working with a ton of stakeholders from all over Minnesota for how to spend that money. Uh, no one's identified a single thing that they object to or think went too far or not mm. far enough. So I'm puzzled by it and I'm disturbed by it. This puts a target on Minnesota's back. We are now the only state in the country, the only state not to get its money. And so what I have said um, to legislators is, look, the reason we have a target on our back is if you were a wrongdoer out there, <laughs> where would you go first? To one of the 49 states that has already for months been spending its election security money or the one state where you know they haven't spent a penny of it yet. So to be continued, mm -hmm. I hope that the legislature and the Senate in particular will come to its senses and authorize us to use that money, but it's a real concern. Well, being optimistic and hoping we get that funding, what are the steps you'd take to secure our election system? Sure, I think the first thing, job one, is to redo or recode uh, what's called the statewide voter registration system. Mm -hmm. It's a database that was built about 15 years ago with a lot of federal and state money, and it was built well 15 years ago. But like a lot of things built well 15 years ago, maybe that flip phone you loved uh, in 2004, uh, it needs upgrading and modernization. So doing that is job number one. We need to hire a few people to basically do computer coding and recode and redesign that system, and it's a longer term project. So that's number one. But then there's a whole suite of options, software, hardware, other technology that federal intelligence officials have recommended to us. We had the Department of Homeland Security come to our office. They sent a team of six or seven people. They stayed for a week. This was last summer. And they wrote a report. They assessed our vulnerabilities. And they made some recommendations for us. And this is the outgrowth or the outcome of their recommendations. Wow, sounds like we can do a lot if we can get some funding to do it. We can. Okay. Um, let's move on to the presidential nomination pro primary. That's right. something relatively new in Minnesota, and you already have some changes you'd like to uh, see. That's made. right. Well, just for your viewers' benefit, so um, in 2016, after both major parties' caucuses were uh, overwhelmed by the enthusiasm and turnout and participation, the legislature made a decision that in 2020, we would go not to a caucus system, but to a primary system to select party delegates for the major parties. Mm -hmm. So instead of showing up in a junior high basement or gymnasium <laughs> for a caucus, it'll be a real election in real polling places run by local governments with, with all the compliments <laughs> that you see. But there are a couple problems, and they're big problems that I and others have identified that need to be changed this year. The biggest one has to do with voter privacy. 
the way that the law was written in 2016 was that there will now be two separate ballots for the two major parties. Actually, four. We have four major oh. parties in Minnesota now, <laughs> the two marijuana legalization parties. But there will be a separate ballot for each major party. And the voter, either in the polling place or otherwise, if they vote absentee or from home, will have to choose a ballot. So far, so good. The problem is the choice of ballot will now be a public record unless mm -hmm. the legislature changes that loophole. It will be public. Now, obviously, your choice won't be public, <laughs> which candidate you vote for, but which party's ballot you choose will be public. And I have to say, I get around Minnesota a lot. I go to all 87 counties every year. Every year I've been in office, I talk to a lot of people. I can tell you, Minnesotans will hate this idea. We have never had party registration in Minnesota. There are others of your viewers who have lived in places that do. We never have. And I think Minnesotans, while we're number one in the country in participation, not everyone wants to wear their party allegiance on their sleeve. And they want to keep that private. And they don't want their neighbor or their employer or the person in their house of worship or their book club or their kids, parents, or whoever to know their party allegiance or loyalty. And I want to keep that private like it's always been. Otherwise, if the legislature fails to do its duty and fails to change that law this year, we're going to have kind of a backdoor party registration system. We'll be like those other states where you register to vote and have to say, yep, I'm a Democrat or a Republican. And I would say it's even worse than a party registration system because in the states where you register by party, there's always an option to say unaffiliated or independent. Oh. Here, if you want to participate in the presidential primary, there is no such option. You've got to pick a side, and that side that you pick will be a public record. And I think there are many people in many mm. professions, whether it's a school administrator or a journalist or a judge or someone else who, by virtue of their public position, doesn't want to wear that on their sleeve and out themselves. Uh, they're entitled to their opinions, but they just don't want that public. This is going to be a real problem. So we want to reverse that situation. We are also talking with cities and counties about the possibility of doing this entire contest by mail. Mm. We could do it more cheaply. We could do it more easily. We could reduce burdens on local governments. And remember, this is a unique kind of election. We're not really electing a candidate. We're really apportioning delegates to national party mm. conventions. So if there's ever a contest that was made for doing it by mail cleanly, uh, easily, and cheaply, this might be it. So we're exploring that as well. Have we ever done a mail-in election like that in Minnesota? To my knowledge, we have never done a fully mail-in election in Minnesota. This might be an interesting one to start with. It's my understanding that the costs of this primary election are fall on the cities and jurisdictions to do this in a way that didn't happen before. Because before, it's my understanding that the parties incurred the cost of uh, the caucuses and things like that. That's right. So really, there's some hidden costs in this legislation for the cities. There are. Correct? Now, to the, to, the, to the legislature's credit, when they passed this law in 2016, they basically put IOU language, so to oh, speak, okay. in the bill saying, hey, look, counties, cities, we don't want to leave you holding the bag. You'll be reimbursed. But one of the things we're pushing for in our office is some more explicit language about mm -hmm. the categories of reimbursement. To your point, we should not have local taxpayers and local governments at the city or county level on the hook for one penny more than mm -hmm. their costs when it comes to um, what is, in essence, an intra-party yeah, and internal party, party function. Yeah. So I think Minnesotans will like the access of a presidential primary. They won't have to show up in a gym or a junior <laughs> high at 7 p.m. on a snowy night if they don't want to. On the other hand, they're not going to want their privacy violated this way. I know they're not. And so I'm really um, leaning on the legislature to do the right thing and make sure that we have this primary without fear that people are going to be, have their political affiliation outed in some way. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you've um, sent out a press release, at least, on uh, the issue of a timeline for future special yes. elections. That's also come up this year. Is, is that different than other years? Has this law always been on the books, but it just... It's just yeah. the timing of this that was the problem? It, it was both. Um, okay. There's a law that's been on the books for quite some time that says that when there's a legislative vacancy during the legislative session, as opposed to some other time, okay. if it happens during the session, then there's a real tightened, constrained oh, okay. timeline of 35 days from start to finish, from the close of filings, through a primary, if there is one, to the general election. And there are no bad guys here. I think when the legislature passed that law, what they meant to convey is 
look, during the <laughs> session, we want to hurry up and make sure folks are represented sure. and that there isn't a vacancy longer than there needs to be. But what we just discovered last month with the special election up in Senate District 11, which is in the sort of Pine, Carlton, St. Mm -hmm. Louis County area, um, 35 days is just too short. It really is. And especially for communities that have a large percentage of people who vote by mail, mm -hmm. uh, some people in Minnesota live in jurisdictions where they can yeah. only vote by mail. There is no polling place. Mm -hmm. You're really tempting fate, and you're really um, uh, potentially or actually disenfranchising people. In that instance, just last month, there were 400 ballots that, because of the tight timeline, tight timeline didn't get there in time. They arrived, but arrived too late to be counted. 400 people. We'll never know how they voted, whether it could have tipped a result. We don't want to do that. And so um, just today, in fact, I testified um, on mm -hmm. behalf of a bill that our office drafted to lengthen that um, uh, time mm -hmm. from 35 days to 49 days, adding two more weeks on there. That way, we can make mm -hmm. sure people aren't disenfranchised. It will mean two more weeks that someone yeah. living in a place with a vacancy mm -hmm. will have no representation. But on the other hand, you don't want to shut people yeah. out. Minnesota got to number one and has stayed number one uh, when it comes to voter turnout because we prize access. And I don't want to see that get um, diluted. Terrific. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about that's on your legislative agenda this time? It sounds like a, quite a bit. Well, we have a, a lot of other things, too, things like pre-registration for high school students. Oh. This is something that uh, uh, oh, a good dozen or more states do. Again, red states, blue states, doesn't matter where. Um, high school students starting at age 16 can get into the system. They're not registered. You can't register before, and obviously they can't vote, but they're into the system earlier oh. so that we can do the vetting and screening. And then on their 18th birthday, they will automatically be registered to vote on the basis of that information. It's worked out really well in other states, has really moved numbers in terms of voting and gotten young people to think of themselves as voters even before they are voters, which is So good. how do they get into the system at 16? Is that through the driver's license application? Yeah, it can be large? driver's license, or by and large it is, but there are other ways too, other documents they can okay. provide, and, hmm. and they can get into the system, and it's worked out really well hmm. in a number of states. Florida is a recent one as well, Louisiana, other states where it's really had an impact on young people voting. That sounds like it'd be helpful since that has been in the past um, a population that doesn't always feel like they have a say and don't get out to vote. So. That's right. I think Minnesota has the same situation as everywhere in America I'm aware of. That youngest yeah. chunk of voters, let's say 18 to 24, it's really tough to get them yeah. to vote at the same rates as the rest of mm -hmm. us. And if it were an easy problem to solve, it would have been solved mm -hmm. years and decades ago. But we're always looking for that next reform, mm -hmm. that next thing that can move yeah. it along. Okay. Anything else you'd like to comment on or... Well, talk just about? Ju I, w I would just say this. You know, we are blessed in Minnesota mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons to have good laws on the books, to have a culture that supports voting, including the League of Women Voters, I might add, a very vigorous and strong league presence and nonprofit presence. And we have general confidence in the system. But we can't rest on our past success. Mm -hmm. We can't rest on our laurels. We have to keep investing in democracy. That means money sometimes, but it also means investing in people mm -hmm. and investing in policies that are going to keep what we have and make sure that for the foreseeable future, Minnesota remains not just number one in voter turnout, mm -hmm. but one of the examples for the rest of the country. And we are that right now. We are the envy of so much of the rest of the country. People tell me all the time nationally they wish their state was more like Minnesota when it came to voting and democracy. So let's keep that up. Thank you, Secretary Simon. I appreciate your being here. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And uh, hope you're successful. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. After a short break, I'll be talking to Nick Harper with the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. Check out LMCC on Facebook. Be sure to like and friend us so you can keep up with all the happenings or to watch one of your favorite videos. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Kay Erickson with the League of Women Voters of South Tonga. And in this segment of the program, I'm going to be talking to Nick Harper with the League of Women Voters of Minnesota about the issues the League is interested in during this legislative session. Welcome to the program, Nick. Before we start asking questions, can you tell me a little bit about what you do at the League of Women Voters? Sure. My title is the Civic Engagement Director. So I am the staff uh, lead for advocacy at the state level, and I hope our members and volunteers uh, do that advocacy. And then during the election season, I also am a staff support member for our local members who do our nonpartisan voter outreach and engagement. Oh, sounds like a busy job. It is. <laughs> 
Now, in the first part of the program, Secretary of State Steve Simon talked about his legislative agenda. Are there things on his agenda that the league supports? Yeah, we actually um, agree with a lot of what Secretary Simon has on his list and his priorities. Um, our, what we're focusing on is a little bit different in some cases, um, but we're a very big supporter of the Restore the Vote. Um, we're a member of the Restore the Vote Coalition. Okay. So we are working with um, other organizations, faith-based organizations, criminal justice reform mm. organizations, um, voting advocacy organizations, to, uh, and other democracy organizations to, um, to make that a successful bill this session. Um, we also are supporting automatic voter registration, okay, okay. Um, and we are working on that with the Voting Rights Network. Okay. Um, and of course, we also are supporting election cybersecurity funding. Um, it's kind of a niche issue, so not a lot of people are really interested in, in cybersecurity funding, but uh, the League is definitely trying to be supportive of that as well. Okay. Um, Primary, the presidential primary is on our list of issues okay. to keep monitoring. Okay. Um, specifically, uh, there are multiple issues that I think um, local election officials would like to see changes to the how it's currently set up. Okay. But we agree with the Secretary Simon, the biggest one for the league at least is that political affiliation would be public mm -hmm. information. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of voters who even, they don't even realize that, for example, their address is public information mm -hmm. when they register or that the fact that they've registered to vote is public. And even that is frustrating to them when they learn that. So then to <laughs> come back and say, well, now also your, your political affiliation um, is, will be become public, I think a lot of voters will be very frustrated and angry with that. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, voters, this, as Secretary Simon said, you're not, it's not a traditional election. You're really, picking delegates yes. to go to a partisan convention. But voters expect this to look like and act like an election yes. uh, because they think it's, they think it's a, it's a it traditional primary. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so they will, they'll have certain expectations, including the privacy <laughs> of their information yeah. that we should try to meet in Minnesota. Well, I hope we can do that. Um, let's talk about a couple of other issues that are in league's radar right now. One is the 2020 census, and the other is redistricting. Mm -hmm. And those two things really go hand in hand. They do very you much. Want to talk about how that works? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um, the census is the process by which the United States, under the Constitution, must count every person who lives in the United States. Uh, that data is then used, that count, is then used uh, to apportion um, how many representatives each state gets in the House of Representatives and how many votes they get in the Electoral yes. College. And uh, so redistricting at the congressional level, at a minimum, is, is relies upon the census data and making sure that the census data is accurate. Um, it's especially important for Minnesota this year uh, because Minnesota is at risk of losing a congressional seat. Yeah. So uh, we want to make sure that we have as full and accurate and complete account in Minnesota this year because if there's a chance that we might be able to keep that seat if we are able to fully count everyone in Minnesota. And that's something we need to make clear. It's my understanding that it's not just citizens or voters that are counted, it's all Minnesotans that need to be counted no matter why they're here. Absolutely, Because yes. it affects other things besides just the redistricting. It affects policy decisions, mm -hmm. how much Minnesota is allocated in federal funding from the federal government. Yes. Um, Yes, very that's much a big so. Chunk of change. Yeah, so um, that's exactly true. The Constitution does require that we count every person, regardless of their citizenship status, in Minnesota. Um, so we do want to make sure that we're counting every single person, um, and that includes infants as well. <laughs> um, that's actually a big push that mm. um, sometimes new parents, in of course the <laughs> very busy point point of their lives, um, forget to <laughs> forget to, to count their child, um, and that's no. one of the things that we try to push that will be. Um, that we'll be pushing is to make sure that, that children get counted as well. And being able to build um, a trust in the process and um, protect individuals who are concerned about retribution from the government if they yeah. are not a citizen, regardless of whether they're um, you know, here uh, authorized or not. Mm -hmm. um, because even uh, immigrants who are here, even immigrants who have received citizen status are concerned about retribution mm -hmm. Um, and uh, in the current political climate. Yeah. And um, you, know, you pointed out that the census data also 
influences policy mm -hmm. um, very strongly, and that's very true. Um, the data is used in order to evaluate policies on a variety of levels, levels. and even private businesses use right. census data in order to evaluate um, you know, different pieces of their business and whether or not certain decisions are good or not for, their, for a local business. So it's not just something that's good for government, <laughs> it's good for businesses as well. Um, and it's also good for funding purposes for the state. So the state of Minnesota receives per person per year about $1,500 um, from um, federal money that is dependent on census-related okay. data. So examples of that might be Social Security, Medicaid, highway funding, but it can also include things like uh, food programs at, yeah. at and nutrition programs mm -hmm. for, uh, for schools, including both breakfast and lunch, and also mental health funding, um, and a lot of rural programs as well. So oh. loans that will help um, people buy homes in rural areas of the state or um, rural business loans, those also are reliant on census data. So it, it helps everyone in the state uh, to make sure that we have an accurate count uh, of census data. There's been a great deal of controversy about adding a, a question about citizenship. Um, do we know where that is at the federal level? Um, and why that's a concern? Yeah, so the concern is that it has not, there's multiple levels. Um, the first level is that it hasn't been fully tested. And it typically when a question gets added to the census, it's tested really well oh, okay. uh, to make sure that it won't impact the response rate of the census. So it hasn't been tested. And the second piece is that there is very strong evidence that it will, in fact, negatively influence mm -hmm. the response rates, um, especially from, as we stated earlier, mm -hmm. immigrant communities yeah. who are fearful of retribution. And um, regardless of whether or not okay. they are you know, here uh, authorized or not or undocumented or not. Um, and so the citizenship question may result in an undercount mm -hmm. um, because because many Minnesotans will be fearful of responding mm -hmm. to the census. At the federal level, um, Congress could introduce legislation in order to prevent the question from being added, um, but that would require, I believe, consent from the Senate as well, of course. Um, and the Senate currently appears to be supporting the addition of the census mm -hmm. question. Okay. Um, but it's also in federal courts, and uh, we'll see what happens in the federal court mm -hmm. system um, as time goes by. Okay. Do you know what the state's planning to do to get the word out? How are they going to publicize this? Um, yep. So um, the the state's efforts are being coordinated through the state demographer, demographer's office, which makes sense because <laughs> they are the person who <laughs> counts and helps understand who lives in Minnesota. <laughs> so the state demographer's office is the hub, really, in terms of the government branch who's really working on this. And they're working very closely with the regional census office in Chicago. And um, they have put together what's called a state complete count committee. Oh, okay. And so that is an, a partnership and committee of um, a very wide um, swath of organizations. So that includes nonprofit organizations, local governments, county governments, mm -hmm. um, businesses, chambers of commerce, um, educational institutions, a really large variety of organizations in order to figure out what is the best way to ensure mm -hmm. that we get a complete mm -hmm. count because it really does benefit every kind of person in Minnesota and every kind of organization. In addition to the state complete count committee, there also in the nonprofit sector is the census mobilization partnership. Mm -hmm. And that is a, um, I would call it kind of like the other, the other side of the, the other rail of the train track. Mm -hmm. um, they are developing specifically um, messaging to um, that would be that resonates with different communities in Minnesota to help them understand the importance of mm -hmm. and the safety of uh, responding to the census mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. And they are working very closely with community organizations that work with um, immigrant communities, for example, to make sure that uh, the count is accurate and the immigrant communities feel safe. Now, I know in the last census, our local league and a number of other leagues were involved in getting out information out about the census. Do you know what the league is planning to do to promote um, leagues getting involved? Yeah, we are definitely trying to um, collaborate and coordinate with the state complete count committee okay. as well as the census mobilization partnership. And we'll gear up with the actual messaging of the census as this next year goes on. Um, and we'll be partnering with um, other community organizations, hopefully, in order to reach um, those communities that might are 
most likely to be uh, undercounted. Okay. Well, now that, you no, know, once we count all the Minnesotans, the next step is redistricting because all that information is used to redraw district maps. Can you talk about um, League's proposals for redistricting? Yeah, so the redistricting process in Minnesota um, has been an interesting one. <laughs> yes. So in Minnesota, in theory, what's supposed to happen <laughs> is that the legislature is supposed to draft new maps and pass it just like they would any other bill. The Senate proposes something, the House proposes something, they come to a compromise, they send it to the governor, the governor signs it. That has not happened um, since 1960s, um, except it did happen in 1992, and that's mm -hmm. only because at the time, Governor Arne Carlson intended to veto the map and did not correctly do so. So then there was litigation over whether or not the veto was valid. Mm. So the point is we haven't had a redistricting process without significant litigation since the 1960s. And the question is, why would we continue to rely on a broken process? Um, what has happened when there has been litigation? So you're saying that the, the House and Senate draw their maps, mm -hmm. but then it ultimately ends up in the courts and the courts decide. Yes, right? because okay. what happens is either the House or the Senate can't agree yeah. or it gets vetoed by the governor, yeah. right? Okay. Um, and so then it goes to the courts because you do have to do redistricting <laughs> under the yes. constitution. <laughs> and so the courts have to get involved. Traditionally what has happened is the court has appointed a panel of three to five judges mm -hmm. and then the judges draw the maps. Um, <laughs> they accept proposals from certain organizations and from the, the legislature of course, but then they draw a final map. Um, and that is expensive, mm -hmm. and that's not very open and participatory because it, you know, <laughs> a judicial a, a litigation is, you know, fairly closed off to the public mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, I mean, technically, it's open to the public, but unless you're a party or unless you know exactly how mm -hmm. litigation works, it can be hard to track. So, in Minnesota, the league has been working on a new way to approach mm -hmm. redistricting, okay. especially because even if you assume that everything goes well in Minnesota and that everyone agrees, um, there is a potential that if one single party uh, controlled the House and the Senate and the governorship, mm -hmm. they would be able to gerrymander a map and there, would no, you know, there wouldn't be a way to stop that politically. So um, what's been proposed in the past by Governor Car Arne Carlson and Vice President Walter Mondale was a five judge panel um, that was appointed by the legislature okay. um, at the forefront. They would draft maps and then send those draft maps to the legislature to then approve. Uh, because under the state constitution, the legislature currently must have the final say on whether a map gets approved or not. Um, that has been around for at least one or two redistricting cycles as a, as a potential reform. Um, but part of the problem with that proposal is that Judges in Minnesota tend to be almost overwhelmingly white and male and wealthy. And um, there, are, there are many, we received some feedback from community members who felt that if we wanted to have a map that was truly representative mm -hmm. of the people, then there should also be a system that is truly representative of the people. So, um, and the league does, does believe that there should be an independent commission that has everyday citizens, not just judges, okay. for example. So the compromise that we've kind of worked out um, as we've discussed potential reforms with Common Cause Minnesota, which is another great organization working on this issue, is to have a hybrid commission that mm. has five judges who are appointed by the legislature mm. and then 12 members of the public oh, who are yeah. oh. go through a vetting process. Um, hmm. They would apply to be part of the commission, there are certain requirements that would exclude people so that they would not be eligible. So for example, you do have to be eligible to vote in order to be part of the commission. You can't have, um, uh, you can't be um, a, an active lobbyist or mm -hmm. you can't be a politic, you can't be an elected official. Mm -hmm. um, so those individuals would be excluded. That would create three pools of public members. One pool of public members who identify as members of the DFL party mm -hmm. or with the D DFL party, uh, one pool who affiliate with the, the Republican party, and then one pool that do not affiliate with either of those okay. two major parties. Um, the leadership of the legislature would be able to 
strike members from that mm -hmm. pool, um, similar to how attorneys would strike members of a jury during the jury selection process, if anyone's familiar with that. <laughs> um, but essentially that just means that they get to say, out of this pool of 40 people, I don't think that these seven are good enough to be on the commission, or I don't want them to be on the commission. That would still leave a pool, a fair, a fair sized pool, who would then be randomly selected oh. And then their event, after the, select, the random selection, there would be four members of the public on the commission who affiliate with the DFL mm -hmm. party, four members who affiliate with GOP, and four who do not affiliate with either major party. So those 12 members of the public <laughs> and the five judges uh, would then uh, form the commission. It's quite a process. It's quite a process, <laughs> but it's been very carefully thought out to mm -hmm. ensure that the legislature still retains some control over who mm -hmm. eventually ends up in the process because the legislature does feel very antsy um, <laughs> since they do ultimately yeah. are responsible for the final maps under the constitution and but still maximizes the ability of members to participate in the process um, the commission system the bill that we've proposed which uh, is house file 1605 um, that would also require that the meetings be open to the public, that members could participate by offering testimony to the commission. Um, and it also has a set of very strong principles by which um, potential maps would be judged so that we've outlined the guidance mm -hmm. on um, how the maps should be drawn as well. Okay. Now other states um, have some kind of commissions, don't they? I mean, this wouldn't be the only state with a, a, this kind of a process. Yeah, correct. Um, so there are several states that al already have um, or have recently implemented a citizens-based commission. Okay. So Arizona is one, California is another, um, and I believe there are other states, uh, either Ohio or Michigan or perhaps even both, um, are moving towards the citizen model. Th the thing that would be different about this proposal is that it would, because the Minnesota Constitution requires the legislature to mm -hmm. pass the maps. Um, we have to settle for essentially would be an advisory commission. Oh, okay. um, they don't have final say, the oh. legislature retains final say. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say that in the future we couldn't change, mm -hmm. move for a constitutional mm -hmm. amendment mm -hmm. to change it so that there is a true independent commission. Um, but for this upcoming redistricting cycle, if we proposed a constitutional amendment it wouldn't be ratified in the Constitution until the fall <laughs> yeah. of 2020. And um, drawing the legislative maps has to start the very next year <laughs> in January. So there wouldn't be enough time to accept applications mm -hmm. and the whole, it, accept the application process and appoint the judges and members of the public. So um, we have to start with an advisory statutory okay. for this upcoming session, for the uh, cycle of redistricting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if, uh, we can also move for a constitutional amendment if people want something, uh, a, a completely and fully independent commission as well. Let's talk briefly about why redistricting reform is so important. Mm -hmm. um, redistricting has the opportunity, if done by one party, of protecting the incumbents of one party. Mm -hmm. Or it can be done on a nonpartisan basis. The Republicans and Democrats, or whoever, mm -hmm. can get together and decide to protect all the incumbents. Mm -hmm. So, but that. Can you talk a little bit about how that disenfranchises voters? Absolutely. So that's actually one of the hot topics in the legal world these <laughs> days um, is the idea of partisan gerrymandering. Uh, that's actually been to the Supreme Court a couple of times in the past um, couple of years and is going back, as a matter of fact, later this month. <laughs> um, and the with partisan gerrymandering, essentially you manipulate the map in order to um, disfavor or favor a particular po political party. And it can also do it to favor or disfavor incumbents uh, rather than, for example, new challengers. Um, so that is the two types of political gerrymandering. And as you pointed out, there's mm -hmm. also, there's not just, um, you know, gerrymandering that disfavors one party, but you can also have what's called a sweetheart deal <laughs> gerrymandering, oh. which is where the incumbents uh, of both major political parties create a map that protects the incumbents. Mm -hmm. um, the proposal that we have in House File 1605 uh, actually prevents um, partisan gerrymandering, prohibits it explicitly, uh, and also prohibits the intentionally drawing of a map that would benefit an incumbent. And in addition to that, 1605, um, 
has a provision that's not included in the other redistricting reform bill that's offered in the, in the House right now. Um, the, the redistricting bill that we have actually includes a principle called partisan symmetry, oh. which essentially says that even if there's no intent to favor or disfavor a party, mm -hmm. there shouldn't be any ef unintentional oh, effect okay. of favoring or disfavoring a party okay. um, beyond what they deserve sure. as a matter of the votes. Um, partisan symmetry is um, almost universally accepted in political science literature. Hmm. It's almost universally accepted by um, experts in um, redistricting, hmm. and it's been used by both major parties to evaluate partisan bias in maps. Hmm. So it's a very safe measurement <laughs> to use okay. to evaluate whether or not there's been political gerrymandering. Okay. Boy, that's a, you're, you're really busy at the <laughs> legislature. I wish you luck. Thank you. Is there anything about voting or the, anything else that we've been talking about that you'd like to comment on? Um, you know, I think it's a big year for democracy. Um, I think that there has been a lot of movement um, to reinvigorate democracy. And Minnesota always has had a really <laughs> high civic engagement rate yes. and has always really strongly valued democracy. So I'm hoping that we'll have a really <laughs> great turnout um, and results in the legislature this session. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank you so much. Ensuring that our election systems are secure, fair, and accessible goes to the heart of our democracy. For Minnesotans to trust the outcome of our elections, we need systems in place that are protected from outside interference, that provide accurate vote counts, that make voting accessible, that require fair district maps, and that ensure a census that counts all Minnesotans. Voting is important, but as we've heard today, casting a ballot is not all that matters. We need to pay attention to the laws that are enacted at the legislature because ultimately those laws are what ensure a fair voting system for all of us. You can find more information about the Secretary of State's proposals at their website, mnvotes.org. For more information about the League of Women Voters of Minnesota, their website is lwvmn.org. Programs like this are just part of League's mission to make democracy work. We educate people about Issues we advocate on our positions at the local, state, and national level. The League is nonpartisan, which means that we never support political parties or candidates. Our South Tonka League is open to the membership of men and women, 16 years of age and older, and serves the cities in southwest Hennepin County. Our website is lwvsouthtonka.org. We invite you to join us. Finally, I'd like to thank my guests, Secretary of State Steve Simon and Nick Harper with the League of Women Voters for being here today. I'd like to thank the Lake Minnetonka Communications Commission for the opportunity to present this program, and thank you for watching.